Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program created for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our supporters and friends at the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Warrant Officer David Sheets, Commanding Officer of the John T. Dempster Jr. Division of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. I am joined by our all-star, all-Navy support crew of MC-1 Quinlan, our PAO, and STG-1 Lewison, our technical support wizard. Today's topic, aviation ordnance. Cadets, you're really going to like this one. Our presenter today is Petty Officer Second Class Bradley Gossin. If, uh, he has a rate of AO, and we'll learn more about that as our presentation continues. So cadets, this is not passive listening. This is active learning. So as the presentation goes on, ask your questions in the comments section of the YouTube video. We'll try to get to them, and we'll get the answers that you're looking for. Also, there is two hours of virtual drill credit available to you with an online quiz, which will be posted being available after this presentation. Now remember, the online quiz is only available for two days. So get on it, get your answers in there, get your two hours of virtual drill credit. So enough of that. Petty Officer Gossett, the ship is all yours. How's it going, everybody? I'm Petty Officer Gossin. I'm an uh, Aviation Ornament Second Class. Um, currently stationed as a recruiter in the uh, Navy uh, Talent Acquisition Group of Philadelphia. Um, today, we are going to be discussing uh, the Weapons Department, or my job as an Aviation Ornament, and sharing a little bit of time uh, that I had in the Navy and my experiences. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. So. Uh, Aviation Ornament Second Class, Bradley Gostin. You can just call me AO2. That is fine as well. All right, so a little bit about me. I was born in um, North Carolina. My father was in the Marine Corps. I'm from Franklinville, New Jersey. That's where I joined the Navy out of. Um, I've been in the Navy for eight years and one month. Uh, why I joined? I joined, you know, for family tradition. Like I said, my father was in the Marine Corps. My mother was in the Army. Um, it runs through my blood and it, it's something I had to do. Um, and the experience is just something that I didn't think I could get anywhere else in the world and I was right. Um, best thing about my job, AOs have a very important job when it comes to keeping the enemies at bay, when it comes to keeping the peace overseas and not bringing it home, okay? Um, and you know, I'll explain that a little bit more here in depth in a little bit. Uh, one of my top Navy memories is uh, going to Thailand and Australia. Australia was a beautiful country, um, awesome place, and Thailand was just a completely different culture and, and a really cool experience to learn stuff from. Um, some of my assignments, uh, my first one was the U.S. Navy Ceremonial Guard stationed in Washington, D.C., um, also known as the Presidential Honor Guard. Uh, it's a very, very prestigious group. Um, and that was really cool to be able to be able to do that. And my second squad, uh, my second duty was um, Patrol Squadron 40. Um, uh, it's a VP aircraft, uh, anti-submarine, and we'll, I'll explain a little bit more of that later as well. On the left here, you see a picture. It's the Mark 65 mine. That is a 2,000 pound class uh, air laid mine. Um, some of the stuff that mines are used for, you know, uh, control seaward uh, barriers. Uh, you know, defend coastal waterways. Uh, and that is a very, very big weapon. That was the first and only time that I ever loaded one of those. And it was a really cool experience too. That picture was actually taken in um, Okinawa, Japan as well. A little bit of history about the Aviation Ordnancemen. Uh, it was established on March 2nd, 1926 as a rating. The Aviation Ordnancemen Specialty Mark, a winged flaming spherical shell, was incorporated into uniform regulations in January of 1927. So the patch here you see on the right, I'm sure you know, um, is worn on the dress blues, uh, the left sleeve of the dress blues. It, uh, so that patch right there is for Aviation Ordnancemen First Class. You can tell that by the three chevrons underneath of the rating symbol. Uh, so this is a YouTube video about the Aviation Ornament Rating. Uh, you can find it on America, uh, America's Navy's Jobs um, YouTube page. And go ahead and enjoy.
So we may have a significant lack of audio for this. So feel free to narrate what's going on and, and what these uh, these folks are doing. Yes, sir. You're not hearing anything from the video, sir? No, not at all, sadly. But I do see a lot of weapons, so that's great stuff. Yes, sir. So uh, what he's talking about so far is just how they re pretty much the replenishments at sea and transporting the ammunition from one plane to or one ship to the other. Um, and this is the uh, MA, MA-121 uh, machine gun that they use on the aircraft right here. The two uh, duty stations they saw out on a ship or in a squad Was it for a yeah, so uh, un unfortunately, you know, and cadets, like we said, this is live, right? Uh, we are having audio problems uh, from our speaker. So, uh, Peter Sagasin, I'm sure you're giving us some really good information here, but unfortunately, we can't hear it. Yeah. But that's the beautiful part, folks, about, you know, being in the Navy is sometimes things don't always work out. So you adapt and overcome. So this next slide kind of explains a little bit of what that video was explaining as well. Um, so some of the stuff we do as AOs, we inspect, maintain and repair aircraft, mechanical and electrical ar armament ordnance systems. We service aircraft guns and accessories, as you saw in that video. I know once again, you couldn't hear it, but you saw that one person. Uh, taking what we call a speed handle to the gun to uh, get a set screw in there. Um, stow, assemble, and load aviation ammunition, including aerial mines, torpedoes, missiles, and rockets. Uh, load supplemental munitions, assemble, test, and maintain air launch guided missiles, and supervise operation of aviation ordnance shops, armories, and stowage facilities. Um, so some of the stuff that you guys might... Uh, you know, point out to you pretty well is the assembly and stowage and loading of uh, aerial mines, which is that Mark 65 mine that, I, that you guys saw earlier. Torpedoes is something that I specifically specialized in on the P-3 Charlie aircraft. Um, it is anti-submarine weapon um, and missiles and rockets. So out on the right side of this uh, pair of these uh, bullet points here, you see uh, this is actually somebody I worked with. He, uh, at the time, he was AO1 Mitchell, so he was Aviation First Class, uh, Aviation Ordnance Man First Class. Now he's actually an Aviation Ordnance Man Chief Petty Officer. Uh, he made the rank of E7. Um, he's actually inspecting an AGM-65 Maverick. That is actually a live missile. And one of the ways that you can tell that is a live missile is that yellow band around the front. That is a high explosive band. Um, also, a way you could tell a live missile is if it has a brown or a live missile or rocket, it would have a brown band around the um, aft end of the uh, missile to uh, signify a live rocket motor. Okay. Um, so just something I thought you guys would enjoy there. Uh, These are some images. We do have a question coming in from the cadets, which is, you know, about choices. And in particular, with all the, the rates that are available within the Navy, what made you gravitate towards being uh, an ordinance man? So what, something that made me want to be an aviation ordinance man is I've loved weapons, in all honesty, my whole life. I love the big, the big boom of the weapons and everything, and this was one of the best options that I could get. Um, and I love, I love planes. Even to this day, even after working on a flight line for five years, I will still sit there and watch aircraft take off and land and everything. And if you put big boom stuff with airplanes, I mean, that's the job. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can completely relate to that. That's really cool. Um, 
so so that that's a passion and you're able to pursue that passion so what was it like during training like during a school for ordinance so it has to be pretty intense right because you're working with you know equipment that you know is explosive is you know a whole bunch of stuff so you know it's definitely a challenge so how about describing that a little bit so a school definitely is challenging any training that you do in the navy can be challenging um but if you put your mind and and push through it um you'll get through it so some of the stuff that they, they would teach you in an a school for aviation ornament is the basic safety fundamentals of being an aviation ornament because obviously you are working with live weapons there is a lot of danger that comes into play with that so obviously they want to make sure you're as safe as possible um if you ever do end up going to pensacola for any reason and you go into the um the training command there you will hear the aos the AOs are the loudest and proudest rate on that base, and their chant is unmatched. Um, if you get a chance, go onto YouTube and Google or uh, search um, AO uh, A school chant, and you'll you'll hear exactly what I'm talking about. So at, at the same time, okay, um, you, you you were saying that your family has different military backgrounds. So then why Navy? Because neither one of the, the people you referenced were in the Navy, right? So was it, was it the round out, the, uh, the offering within the family, or was there something in particular about the Navy that uh, drove you towards this career? Um, well, sir, I, uh, I love the water. I love being near the water and any of the other branches just didn't do that for me. Um, I grew up, you know, and, and I grew up a decent amount of my life in Massachusetts and North Carolina by the ocean. And even over here in Jersey, you know, I got to the beach every once in a while in the summer and everything. And I've just always loved being near the water. And luckily in the Navy, pretty much anywhere you're going to be stationed is near water. So that was a real big uh, thumbs up for me. So back back to A school again, all right? So, you know, now, now some of the cadets are interested in, in figuring out what that was like, like what a day looked like and how hard or challenging was it? So for me personally, because I, I, I'm really only able to speak off my personal experience, um, A school wasn't very challenging. It was, um, you know, if you paid attention, studied the materials that they needed you to, um, you were pretty much going to be good to go. Uh, when it came to the day, you know, we'd wake up at 5.36 in the morning. We'd do our physical training just as any other class. Ours would be a little more intense because obviously when we get out to the fleet, they want, they expect us to, you know, uh, load a 500-pound bomb or missile by hand. So obviously, you know, we need to do the physical training to keep up with that as well. Um, and then we would pretty much be in class from about 9 a.m., 0900 to about 1600 in, at night or in the evening and then after that we would eat chow and uh be on liberty restricted liberty so what are the what are the type of curriculum that you learned while you were there um like i said before it's pretty much just safety fundamentals uh for the most part now where you would come into the specifics of the weapons or the systems that you're dealing with, that would be your C school, uh, depending on what department you're going to on a ship or aircraft squadron. Okay, that, make, that makes sense. So, you know, you you were assigned to P3 Orions. How did you get that plum assignment? So that one I actually applied for while I was at the uh, ceremonial guard. Um and they look into a bunch of different, you know, th factors when it comes to assigning you somewhere. So um, they looked into what I had to offer and they picked, I was able to actually uh, get my first pick at orders. So I actually applied to go to VP first and I got those orders. Because um, every time you go, you're up for orders in the Navy, you go onto a system and you pretty much can pick your top five orders that you would like. And as long as there's an open billet and you qualify for it, um, the Navy will more than likely give you that spot. So then off you went to sea school. So was sea school specific to the P3 Orion or was it more general based upon weapons? Uh, sea school was based off of base specifically the P3 Charlie Orion because uh, 
As the AO on the P3 Charlie, as you know, sir, we didn't only deal with the weapons as most AOs do. We dealt with the armament systems within the aircraft as well. So we had to learn how to troubleshoot the avionics boxes uh, when it comes to the armament systems and the weapon systems and all of all, all things of that sort. Um, and then alongside, we learned the specific weapons that the P3 Charlie flies, which is a very wide variety of weapons. Okay. Very nice. Now, my last slide here is just a, some pictures of my time in the Navy. Um, so VP-40 ordnance on the top left there, you see uh, me, and that's uh, actually um, – Airman Williams at the time, I believe she's a third class now. Uh, she's actually still at VP-40. Um, she's one of the young ladies that I helped train, mold into the great aviation ornament that she is today. Um, that was our, kind of our symbol for the VP-40 ordinance. Um, down in the bottom left, you see me and the guys that I was with in Okinawa, Japan. <clears throat> um, that is the same ER the standoff land attack missile expanded response behind us. So that is a updated version of the uh, AGM-84 Delta, which is the harpoon missile. So this weapon actually has over the horizon capabilities. So actually can go around the curvature of the earth. Um, in the middle there, that was my trip to Thailand. Uh, so we have AO-3 uh, Rivera in the back there. In the middle, we actually have airmen uh, she changed her name. She was a a a Z, which is an aviation administration man. Um, she was our interpreter while we were in Thailand. Um, and then and the one taking the picture right next to me, because that's me right next to uh, the lady there. That's uh, Petty Officer Mitchell, the same one you saw inspecting the AGM-65 uh, Foxtrot Maverick earlier. Um, top right, you see me riding an elephant. That was also in Thailand. I also got to pet a baby tiger and feed a baby tiger a bottle of milk. That was pretty cool. Um, I just didn't have that image digitally. I have it in a hard copy um, that I keep. And then on the bottom right is my time in uh, the um, recruiting school. So that's just a couple different pictures of my time. Uh, the top left picture is in Bahrain as well. So some of the places that I have been um i've been to bahrain um okinawa japan i've been to a couple different times and then um one second sorry i've been to misawa japan which is in the, in the mainland part of japan and then um i've also been to thailand australia um as you can see in the beginning that was some of the best um places that i've been and it was definitely a good and fun experience. Okay, well, you know, we have some questions coming in from the cadets, so that's, you know, great stuff. So one of the things that they're asking for is, you know, what is it like to actually be an ordinanceman? So, you know, like, for example, it's, it's pretty demanding. So what is the most demanding stuff you have to do in the, in, say, if you're, while you're assigned to the squadron? Okay. Like what is a normal day like? And, you know, are, are there things that you need to do in order to support the mission of the squadron, which are pretty intense, pretty uh, active, and it, it takes pretty much all you have in order to make that happen? Oh, of course. There's there's tons of stuff you got to do. Um, so when it comes to a, a daily routine, um, if first off, you're going to do your pre-operational inspections. As soon as you guys walk into the shop, um, you guys do your pre-operational inspections on all your load equipment, um, all your hoists, your adapters, your trolleys, all that stuff, uh, just in case you have to load a weapon within the snap of a finger, which happens a lot. Um, then you would want to check the flight schedule, make sure none of the flights for the day have, you know, uh, ordinance assigned to them. If they do, um, once the equipment is pre-operationally checked, you would, uh, you know, get your equipment together, sign it out, and go go to work and get that weapon up in the wings. If you didn't have a weapon to load, um, you were just doing the maintenance around the shop on the aircraft that you needed to. So some of the maintenance would include uh, daily inspections. So basically what that has to do is every time a flight comes back from flying or every time a plane comes back from flying, 
um, you would have to do a daily inspection, which is basically checking the integrity of the aircraft, making sure that none of your, as an AO, none of your ordnance equipment got damaged in the flight, and make sure that you do your uh, corrosion prevention as well, because if a piece of equipment is corroded, it's unusable. And then there's, um, you know, we have to maintain the maintenance with the bomb racks, up, uh, install and down and uh, uninstall the bomb racks, the pylons that hold the bomb racks into the wings. And that's a very, that job in its own when it comes to the bomb racks is very um, demanding. It takes a lot of strength and a lot of uh, um, stamina to be able to hold up a bomb rack, which could be from 20 to 50 pounds, depending on what kind of bomb rack it is, while somebody else bolts it in. So that's just kind of also on that aspect of when it comes to um, you know, the physical demand of the aviation ordinance. And that's why our physical training in A school is slightly higher in um, demand when it comes to the different kind of ratings. So, you know, it, it's great when everything works out, right? And you have your normal day and you're loading all this type of stuff. And you seem to be smiling because I think you know where I might be going <laughs> with this, right? I mean, you're handling weapons, right? There, There's a high potential of things not going to plan. So were there any instances while you were working weapons that just, you know, didn't go the way you wanted to? And in particular, made you like, I don't know, cautiously terrified? So, yes, sir. There have been a couple different uh, moments like that, actually. Um, most of those moments were in the Middle East when we were in Bahrain. So, um Luckily, every weapon that we deal with has what we call an EEA, okay, an external evidence of arming. So that's some way on every weapon is different. That's why we have manuals and everything to tell us exactly what weapons have what where. And that's something we're tested on when we go up in our qualifications. So um, chaff and flare, which is the deployment system, which is a um, basically an anti-missile deployment system. Um, we use that in the Middle East anytime we fly in the Middle East due to the you know inherent um, uh, danger out there for conflict um, so one day one of our planes was uh, flying over Afghanistan and I get a call from our maintenance control who is in contact with the aircraft while they're out flying that they deploy their chaff and flare um, or their chaff and flare deployed and um, they didn't hit it. So there's a couple different ways that you can deploy your chaff and flare. There's automatically, which is when the plane senses a missile incoming, it'll deploy it. Or there's menu manually or semi-auto, which you have the option of deploying a certain amount at a certain time. Um, so that was my first experience when it came to actually deploying any kind of uh, ordnance or pyrotechnics or weapons in general. Um, and that was a little nerve wracking because I was, I was newly qualified as a quality assured and safety observer. So I was actually in charge of that evolution of that plane coming back. So I had to take the precautions that were necessary to make sure me and my team and everybody else in the squadron was safe from that aircraft. And then, uh, another time also with chaff and flare, uh, one of my, uh, people I was working with, uh, ended up dropping a bucket. So the thing about chaff and flare is very sensitive munitions. Okay, now if you drop it even from two feet, uh, it's unusable. And he ended up dropping a whole a whole box of thirty of them on the on the deck. So that was uh, that was exciting and a lot of paperwork too. But we took care of it and it got the job done safely. And you'll definitely be trained in the proper ways to get the job done safely. Yeah, I, I, I could see that there's, you know, even from my experience, so cad, cadets, uh, Peter Sargassan and I were, were talking before the video, so he and I share experiences um, on the P-3 Orion, and there, the aircraft itself, you know, was manufactured initially in the early 60s, and the, the P-3Cs were like the late 60s or so, so it's like flying around in a classic car in many <laughs> respects, right? And it continuously wants to let you know that it's in charge Right. So, you know, when Peter Sagasson is talking about flare systems just deploying because they feel like it, um, well, that's probably because the aircraft felt like deploying it. Right. And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, 
One of the other things on the aircraft with its mission of anti-submarine warfare is sauna buoys. So, Peter Augustin, can you talk a little bit about sauna buoys and building the Magnavox Mountain? Yes, sir. So, um, sauna buoys are the primary, um, not the primary weapon because it's not considered a weapon, but sauna buoys are what we use to search for uh, submarines. So, there's three different main types of uh, sauna buoys. So, the first one is a 36 Bravo sauna buoy. That is the nomenclature for it. Um, that actually measures the temperature of the water because the temperature of the water can determine, you know, um, a bunch of different stuff when it comes to where the submarine's been, how long it's been there, how deep it is, and all that, all that um, information. And then the 53 Foxtrot, which is another type of sauna buoy, that's basically that's a passive sauna buoy. So that's basically just an underwater microphone. So the way that works is you'll deploy it from the uh, aircraft. It'll open a parachute. Um, it'll float down to the water, and then it'll, you can set the depth on how far down you want it to go. Um, and you, you know, you drop it in there, and then the uh, acoustic operators up in the aircraft are going to be able to uh, listen and make sure that there's no disturbances. And they're they are trained specifically in their job to be able to identify uh, what kind of submarine is in there, how big it is, how how far away it is, and all those kind of informations as well. The other one is a 62 Echo. So that is what we call an active sauna buoy. Um, the job of an active sauna buoy is pretty much what it kind of sounds like. It activates and then it sends out uh, basically a sonar, a ping is what we call it, right? So basically it sends out a sonar and bounces off of any surfaces that might be in the ocean. Obviously, if there's a submarine, it's going to bounce around the submarine and be able to shape out the submarine. Um, that's probably the most effective sauna buoy we have. Uh, but the one we use the most is the 53 Foxtrot because our, our our gentlemen and ladies up in the aircraft are very well trained to be able to use that kind of sauna buoy to uh, accomplish that. Um, something else that we use that we that we shoot out of the same what we call the SLCs, the sauna buoy launch containers. Uh, those are what hold the sauna buoys and shoot them out. Um, is called an EMAT. An EMAT is an expendable mobile anti-submarine training target. All right. So basically what this is, is it, if you open it up, um, there's a mini submarine inside. It look, kind of looks like a mini torpedo, but it's a mini submarine and it acts as a training target for our air crews to get the perfect training um, as, as if it was a real submarine. It's pretty cool. I, I, I thought I was amazed the first time I saw it because um, – you know, I never thought there would be a little tiny submarine in a in this plastic tube. That's impressive. I've never seen one of those before. When we trained, we just used the Russians. So that. Was <laughs> um, so as far as sauna buoys, one of the questions is, well, how big are these things? Because we're talking about them. So, what a what's their basic size? Since we're not seeing a picture of them right now. So, average height of them would probably be about. Three feet, um, and each one weighs different. So the lightest one is the 36 Bravo. Um, that one only weighs about, I think it's 20, 24 pounds. Uh, the 53 Foxtrot weighs about 36 pounds. And then the 62 Echo, which is one of the heavier sauna buoys, that one actually weighs about 42 pounds. So, you know, so in addition to what we were talking about as far as rockets and mines, uh, the aircraft also has torpedoes. Yes. So, yeah, so torpedoes are pretty cool. Can you talk about torpedoes and the training that you had and what it's like to load them and, and anything else that, you know, really describes this weapon? So torpedoes, uh, torpedoes are the primary weapon for anti-submarine warfare. Okay. That is the actual primary weapon that the P3 Charlie is technically de designed to, uh, drop. Uh, they're loaded in the bomb bay of the P3 Charlie aircraft and in the weapons bay of the P8 Alpha Poseidon, which actually is, uh, taking over for the P3 Charlie. Um, it's a very intricate system when it comes to loading the torpedoes um, because in a P3 Charlie, you can have up to eight of them in the bomb bay. 
the Bombay is not a very uh, spacious area. So imagine um, a, a small sedan, the size of a small sedan, and imagine fitting eight highly explosive tubes um, that are pretty much more than three quarters the length of that small sedan. It's a, it's a small area for you know a large weapon, and it, it gets a little tight, but it's fun. It definitely is fun when you do it right and they come back without them and you know that they dropped them successfully because of the way that you and your team loaded them. Uh, it's, it's really nice. The two types of torpedoes that we mainly use are the Mark 46 and the Mark 54. Um, the main difference is uh, there's a, a weighted belt on the Mark 46, which can determine how, how shallow or how deep you want that torpedo to go. Um, the Mark 54 it doesn't have any weight belt on it. Um, it's a high speed. Um, it kind of it swims shallow for the most part, um, and they're designed to destroy submarines. That's basically what they do, um, and it's a really really cool experience because m the majority of aviation ordnance men uh, don't deal with torpedoes, especially the aerial torpedoes. They might deal with them on a ship, but even then, it comes down to um, you know the submarine. Uh, machinist made weapons that deal with those uh, so it's definitely a cool experience and one that a lot of aviation ordnance men don't even get the opportunity to have so one of the cadets was was focusing on um, your earlier description is you like things that go boom I think we all do <laughs> um, is there a particular weapon that's your favorite and then, of course, I'm going to ask you which one you really just don't like. But let's go positive. Let's go positive out of the gate. So is there a particular weapon that you like working with, loading, having anything to do with? So the Mark six, or the AGM-65 Foxtrot, the uh, air-to-ground missile 65 Foxtrot, the Foxtrot stands, F stands for infrared. Um, there's two types. There's the uh, 65 Echo, which is a laser-guided missile. And then there's the Foxtrot, which is infrared. Um, I love that missile. It's 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 a rail guided missile or rail launched missile. So you basically load uh, LAW 117. You you attach the LAW 117 to the missile and then load the missile and launcher up together into the into the rack. Um, that's actually the weapon that you saw uh, Petty Officer uh, or Chief Mitchell uh, inspecting when he has the dome cover off. He's inspecting the lens of the uh, missile to make sure that there's no scratches or, or cracks or dents in it. Um, but the reason I love that missile the most is that's the first missile that I loaded. And that's the first live missile that I loaded as well. Um, and it's the most, it's the missile that we flew the most in the Middle East as well. So I had to be proficient at it. And since I was so proficient at it, I got to know it pretty well and enjoy the capabilities of that weapon also. So then we'll go on the other side. Is there one which is just so temperamental, just such a challenge, that it's not really your number one favorite of working with? Um, let's see. You know, we, we in the shop, we always talked about which missile we liked the most. We never really talked about which one we hated the, the most. Um, <laughs> okay. When it comes to the weapons, though, just because of – the small space and, and how much time it takes to load one weapon, depending on the, you know, the, the, um, experience that your team has. Cause you know, I've been in for eight years, but I could still have a team of people that collectively have been in for four years. So the torpedo is probably the most, the most difficult, um, weapon to load, but I wouldn't say I hate any weapon the most. Um, but the, tor the torpedo was definitely probably the most frustrating weapon out of all of them to load just because of the detail it takes to arm it and um, the detail it takes to load them in general. Because um, one of the stations in the Bombay of the P-3 Charlie aircraft, when you load the weapon, you have to have the hoist, which we use a H uh, hoist loading unit, HLU-288, which is a crank, crank hoist, to load the weapons into the racks. Now... When we do that on one of the stations in the P-3 Charlie aircraft, you actually have the hoist outside of the bomb bay. 
and it is very loud on the flight line. They're very, very loud. So then you have to try, you pretty much have to have an interpreter on the edge of the bomb bay doors telling the hoist what to do while the team leader inside the uh, bomb bay is actually controlling the load. So that one can get a little difficult. Um, but like I said earlier, it takes so much to do those web, to do the torpedoes that once you get it actually up in the hooks, it's, it's worth it. It is. So I, I know from, again, from experience that there's a lot of inspections that go on in a patrol squadron, right? For the flight crews, maintenance crews, but there is, you know, or at least I remember at the time, some very steep competition between ordnance shops in different squadrons and they'll compete for, you know, their evaluation with the overall wing um, in order to, to show their level of, of proficiency. Um, were, were you ever part of that? And what was that like? Yes, sir. So uh, the main inspection that aviation ordnance men have uh, on a squadron is their CWTPI inspection, was, which consists of conventional weapons, technical proficiency inspection. So <clears throat> what this is meant to do, this inspection is meant to do is to make sure that you and your squadron and your other team members are following um, instructions and the publications presented to you. Um, now I don't like to brag or anything, but you know, we got Go the ahead. best score. Go ahead. Our, uh, our squadron got the best score in wing 10. Um, my final year there, actually, we got a perfect score the year before I was out of that inspection because of a shoulder injury actually, but the inspection I was a team leader on that final one, uh, we got the best score out of the wing on that one. Um, so that was, that was very that was a very cool experience to do and a very good way to go out um, because that was actually within my last six months at that squadron. But those inspections are very, very um, in detail and they watch every single move that you do. If you drop a wrench because um, you're messing with it or something, that's a hit. You know, you can't walk under a weapon. That's a safety violation. That's a big hit. You can't step on the test set cables. That's a hit. You can't uh, I mean, hopefully you're watching where you're going and you don't walk into a weapon because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm six, four, so that's very easy for me to do. Um, but I mean, that would be a hit cause that's a safety violation right there. Not being aware of your surroundings. So there's a lot of stuff that they look at and there's a lot of areas that you're not supposed to go into before you check safety, uh, safety features in that area. So that's all stuff that goes into those inspections. That's uh, very, very detailed. So one of the cadets was asking, like, what is one of the proudest moments in your career? That sounds like a pretty highlight, but are there are there other things that you've done so far uh, that you feel really, really good about? Um, one of the biggest accomplishments in my career was being a full systems uh, quality assurance safety observer in, in my last squadron, which is the top ordinance qualification that you can have in the squadron. Um, so basically what that means is that I could be in charge of any kind of loading evolution there is um, from anything as small as uh, pyrotechnics or <clears throat> being in charge of the ammunition for 9mm guns all the way up to loading a live uh, Maverick missile. I mean, I, I was able to, I was qualified to um, perform in all those responsibilities when it comes to being a uh, team member which is basically just somebody who's part of the team and knows the safety precautions and can get the you know get, assist the team and getting the weapon in the hooks <clears throat> to a team leader who actually takes charge of the of the evolution all the way up to like i said the quality assurance safety observer who is the most knowledgeable aviation ordinanceman in that shop <clears throat> yeah definitely something to be proud of right so that you're yeah, you're the person. I don't want to say the guy because that's gender related, right? Because there's incredibly power, uh, talented female AOs, that's for sure. But having that uh, that designation, that's a big deal. That's really a big deal considering what you're working with. Yes, sir. So um, sometimes, you know, and, and again, thinking about what the, the cadets are, are kind of focusing on, it has to do with, you know, maybe concerns and, and concerns in relationship to, you know, you started off on this journey, 
right? You decided to join the Navy. You you were gravitated towards uh, ordinance, which is all fantastic, great stuff. But going through boot camp, going through A school and C school, every, was was there any time that you know you were so challenged that you wished you weren't there, that possibly to would quit? And if you were ever in that, how did how did you get yourself out of that to achieve what you've achieved now? So I'm actually glad you asked that, sir, because there is a moment in my life uh, that was very challenging for me. And um, so I, I was in the Navy for about, this is probably about four years at this time. Um, I had done my time in the ceremonial guard and I was in my squadron at the time. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my mom became very ill. She, uh, she got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, you know, it, I mean, if that happened to anybody that you love, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tear you down. So uh, that's definitely a, a big obstacle that got in my way of my career. And, you know, when something like that happens to a close family member, you want to be there for them. You know, you're not really interested in anything else but being there for them. <clears throat> but, you know, something that got me through it is I know what she wanted for me. And she would want me to continue my career and, and, you know, stay where I am. So luckily, you know, thankfully she, um, you know, she, she, she recovered and, and she went through her radiation and everything. She's good to go. But that was something that definitely put a damper on my time and, uh, you know, kind of stopped me in my tracks for a second. It, it, it affected my life, but I kept going, pushed through it. I just thought of what my mom would want me to do and I did it. I found it interesting that, you know, and of course, this is being in the military, that you use the term about your mom. Oh, yeah, she's good to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, also something I would like to point out is that I was actually able to come home from my from my command uh, because there's this thing called Red Cross, which is absolutely amazing. And I was actually able to witness that for firsthand because my family put out a Red Cross message for me to come home and see my mom when she was in her her deepest slump. So. See, and that's great. I mean, it's again, it's you know, it's your extended Navy family and everybody there supporting all everybody else, right? In order to uh, get through hardships and then celebrate successes, of course, too, right? But you know, it it, it that is a, a wonderful feeling in relationship to the support that you receive from everyone. What one thing that we didn't touch on too much is your experience with ceremonial guard. Like, how did you get into that, and what was what was that like? So the ceremonial guard, um, that was, I had to audition for that, actually, um, for lack of a better term, if you will. Uh, so they came to boot camp uh, when I was in boot camp in 2012, and they said, um, we have these openings. These people from the ceremonial guard are coming to recruit people for the ceremonial guard. It's honor guard, and here are the requirements. You have to be six foot or taller for guys, five ten or taller for females. Uh, you have to be physically fit, look good in uniform, and be able to stand at attention for 45 minutes or longer. Um, you know, I, I was pretty much good to go for whatever the Navy had to throw at me, and that seemed like an opportunity for me because, uh, you know, I'm over six feet, and, you know, seemed pretty good. So, I went for the audit or the uh, interview, I guess is a better word for it. Um, and they were able to, they selected me to go. So I went to the ceremonial guard. Um, I graduated boot camp in June of 2012, went to the ceremonial guard, uh, spent um, about a little less than a month or about a month, about four weeks in training. Uh, the training for the ceremonial guard is very intense, very, very intense. Um, you get up at 4.30, you do physical training, you'll run five plus miles a, a day, um, and it's all just to look good in uniform. Um, you you learn how to walk with perfect balance. You they'll, they'll have you fill up a Dixie cup, a little Dixie cup, full to the brim, um, and walk around the room from your heel to your toe on every step rolling your feet, making sure you don't bounce. If you drop the, if you drop some water, you're doing some push-ups or some kind of uh, physical training at that point. Um, and then they would just have us, they would, they would form us up in a height line. So shortest in the front, tallest in the back. Um, and they would just have us stand there at attention. 
and that was our training because that's what we were going to do when we got out when we got out there into the marching platoon and into the ceremonies that we had to do after training you go into the marching platoon the marching platoon are the main people that do the um any kind of event that or ceremony that has to do with uh any kind of cadence marching uh cordons or anything of that sort so uh, the primary mission of those guys was to do the um, escort remains to their final resting places in Arlington National Cemetery, which was pretty cool because, you know, we had retired Navy people that have their plots out in uh, Arlington National Cemetery. You were able to escort them to their final resting place. Some of them were admirals. Some of them were seamen. Some of them were active duty SEALs. Some of them were active duty um, bosun's mate. I mean, it was a, a very, very honorable honorable job um after i got on a marching platoon in that command i went to the drill team uh drill team was a uh, different experience um my hands got cut up a lot because the the rifles we throw around on the drill team had bayonets on them the practice ones did not have sharp bayonets they were pretty much just rounded pieces of metal but you still needed to understand the weight distribution when you threw the rifle up um but that took so much attention to detail that you wouldn't even think about it without being in that being in those shoes. Um, and it was a it was just an awesome experience. And some of the places that I you know I marched in the 2000 it was for the 2012 uh, election, but the, the inauguration happened in 2013. I marched in that inauguration. That was an 81 man 81 person uh, formation. It was a nine by nine formation. I know you guys march around a lot and stuff, so just imagine trying to keep up with 80 other people. Um, luckily, I was in the front, so I was kind of able to not uh, set the pace, but if it, if it messed up, it more than likely wasn't me. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, that was an awesome experience. Um, I'm sure you guys know who the Chief of Naval Operations is, so he's basically the top dog in the Navy underneath the SEC NEV. Um, and I went to his house for a barbecue. Because he invited the uh, U.S. Navy ceremonial guard to his house for a barbecue, and that was awesome. Who, how many people can say they went to the CNO's house uh, for a barbecue? And I was able to get his his challenge coin um, and the Chief of Navy Reserves challenge coin in the same night. That was pretty cool as well. Um, I did a lot of uh, um, events at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, I wasn't the guy marching on the front. That was, that's the army. That's the uh, army old guard. They are very, very on point. Um, but I would march up the steps whenever we had a, like this Memorial Day. Usually there's an event at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. They lay a wreath on the tomb. The president comes and lays a wreath on the tomb. Um, same with Veterans Day, they do one as well. Um, those events were pretty cool. They were pretty cool. Uh, the, the, the stairs are marble, though. And the shoes we wore for the ceremonial guard are wooden. They're wooden soles with metal, pretty much taps or horseshoes on the toe and the heel. So it clicks every time we walk. So just imagine a smooth piece of marble and a smooth piece of wood with metal on each side, trying to make sure you don't slip down the some steps. So that was, uh, we always laughed about that after every time because there was always somebody that messed up, but that was a good experience. Definitely something that um, probably 90%, if not more, of the Navy can say they did. So how long were you doing that? So that was a two-year tour. So um, usually if you go to a shore duty or a shore command for your first tour, it's usually only two years, as opposed to a normal three-year shore duty. Okay. So that being said... You entered the Navy contracted to go to AO school, I assume. Is that true? I actually joined the Navy as a packed airman, as a uh, prof uh, 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 professional apprentice uh, track program. Oh, career track. Tell us, tell us about that. that. That's something that that I'm not aware of, and I'm sure our cadets aren't aware of either. So the uh, packed airman program, or is actually called undesignated airman at the time. Um, basically, you join the Navy. Uh, without a des designated rate. Um, so basically what that does is um, when you join the Navy, um, you'll join without a specific job, right? So um, basically you 
You'll go to boot camp and you'll go to a basic um, A school, which is ba- you're just learning the basics of uh, aviation, uh, firefighting, that kind of stuff. And then you go to a ship or squadron, depending on where you get sent. Uh, once you get to that ship or squadron, they'll allow you to work with different shops. The You can work with the aviation structural mechanics, the um, parachute riggers, the PRs the AMEs, the Aviation Structural Mechanic Equipment, uh, Survival Equipment. You can work with the ADs, which is the uh, um, Aviation Mechanics. They work with the engines of the aircraft, uh, the AZs, the uh, Aviation Administration Men. Um, Basically, you just work around with the shops and figure out where you want to go. When I left, we actually had an undesignated airman in my shop as well. Um, But luckily, I I never was able to shop around the uh, ratings because I was at the ceremonial guard. I picked up aviation ornament while I was at the ceremonial guard. So um, I didn't really spend too much time in the undesignated uh, rating because when I got out to the actual fleet of the squadron, I was already an aviation ornament. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Great. Um, so back to the weapons, right? Because cadets like weapons, right? So, all right. Who doesn't? So, <laughs> you don't have like just weapons sitting around places, right? So they have to be stored. They have to be somewhere. But you know, if you're going to be loading Mavericks or you're going to be loading torpedoes and all that type of stuff, how does that work? I mean, they have to be somewhere safe, and you have to retrieve them in some way. So, wh- what's the mechanics of that? So our um, our training, what we call shapes, our training missiles and torpedoes and mines and all that, they were actually kept in the hangar, in the hangar bay, um, because my, my aircraft was so big that it never went on a ship. So we would keep them in the hangar bay covered up so they didn't get dirty or anything like that. But people still had to stay away from them because they are training exercise. They are training uh, missiles. So if somebody tampered with the training missile, so the way the way we say in the Navy is, you know, train how you fight, right? So, um, it, so the EEAs that I was telling you guys about earlier, the external evidence of arming. If somebody messes with one of those and it becomes apparent that it's been quote unquote armed, we're going to treat it as such. So that's why people start to stay away from that. When it comes to the live um, ammunition, they are kept in uh, magazines. So magazines can vary in location, different types of magazines. There's a certain publication that tells you how you have to keep um, certain magazines, whether they're underground, above ground, what type of ammunition you keep in them. There's actually a compatibility chart that tells you that you can combine this type of uh, ammunition or this type of explosive with the other and actually stow those together and where you need to stow them as well. No, no. You know, with your experience with ground-based aviation, right? I assume that through A school, that some of your, uh, your your shipmates ended up going out to sea on carriers, right? So, it, do you have any experience talking to them and what their experience is like being out there, like on a ship, managing aviation weapons? Yes. Yeah, so the the shipboard job of aviation management is. Is, is definitely different because there's a few different routes that you can go to when it comes to uh, shipboard aviation ornament. So um, you could be uh, G1, which is uh, like the bomb farm, which they handle the ordnance that goes up to the flight deck and stuff. Um, or you could be down in the G3 department, which is basically um, assembling the bombs and putting them together and building them, putting the explosives in them, uh, putting the fuses in them and all that, all that stuff as well. Um, it's a it's a much faster pace depending on you know what the mission entails no matter what whether in squadron or ship when you're on deployment it's a fast pace you're doing what you got to do uh, to get the mission done you know within the guidelines of course but um ship life in general is just a a, a different aspect when it comes to the way of life to a av like a squadron um but they've all told me it's very fast pace and, you know, I, I, I always wanted to be out there on the ship and get that get that kind of experience, especially of it as an aviation ornament, because they're the ones bringing the bringing the fight to the enemy, you know. Oh, very good. Um, so I'm looking at other questions which are coming in. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, you're loading these weapons, right? Have you had the opportunity to actually see them do their job, actually explode, actually attack something? like any replay videos or seen it live and what what is that like 
I actually have. Well, we had a uh, what we call a Mavex Maverick exercise, which was the AGM AGM 65 Foxtrot that I was talking about earlier. Um, we actually loaded one of those live and shot it off, um, and they shot it off at a target for training purposes. And it actually, we were able to, we were actually able to see watch the video of it actually hitting the target and exploding. So that was pretty cool because I actually loaded that missile and saw it do its thing. Um, now, when it comes to an actual live uh, combat target, uh, the P3 wasn't really um, uh, designed for, <laughs> as as you know, sir, it's not uh, really designed to be there in combat. <laughs> no, that's that's a bad day if that's what it is. <laughs> Uh, cadets, if you're not familiar with the type of aircraft, it's a long-range anti-submarine patrol aircraft. Sometimes it does search and rescue, but it's designed to be out in the middle of the ocean all by itself hunting for submarines. So if you're using it to attack ground targets, um, that's a scary day. Yeah. Okay, so cadets, if you have more questions, please put them in the comments section. Um, until we, you know, get a few more questions going on here, I, I, I'm very interested in, in regards to, you know, the overall experience that you had being an ordnance man. Like, would you have ever chosen a, a different career, like starting out in the Navy? I mean, because you've had experience looking at the different, uh, you know, shops within the squadron, right? And you did mention them about the, the you know, AMEs, ADs, PRs, and all that type of stuff. It, was there something in particular that you, you're gr glad that you made that choice and something that, you know, continues to gravitate you towards, you know, doing that role in the Navy? Um, you know, I wasn't really sure what I was getting into when it came to the aviation ordinance rating. Like I said, I like planes and I like I like uh, stuff that goes boom. So putting those together, what can go wrong? But one thing that definitely gravitated me towards the AO community more and keeps me in there. Um, is probably the camaraderie that the AOs have. Um, we're loud and we're proud. That's that's for sure. Um, we, uh, you know, we have each other's backs. We're all brothers and sisters in the Navy in general. Um, but I know the aviation ordnancemen community, it, and specifically, is just it's is great. And we love we love what we do. And the people who don't love what we do, um, you know, they they f find their way out. And power to them. I hope I hope whatever they do works for them. But aviation ordnance men love their job and they love the people they work with. And you know that that's so important that what you're saying there. Uh, not necessarily those who you know try it and, and and are not you know decide to do something else, but those who respect the job. So for example, my background was was on the flight crew, and if you didn't have the weaponry that you needed, or particularly with the sauna buoys and stuff like that, you really didn't have like a mission, right? So all of these things had to work. And it was always frustrating if you went on to some exercise and you dropped a weapon or, or something and it didn't work, right? Right, because it happens. And, and again, these aircraft are old and things things break, right? But it is incredibly satisfying when it, when it all comes together. So I'm glad you had the opportunity to see that Maverick missile hit something, right? Because it's like, it, everything everything clicked and all the training that you went through all the other stuff that you've done um you know it, it becomes real at that moment so it, it is very rewarding and i'm glad that you like it um one of the questions came through so it's it's interesting how you know the cadets you know know a lot of these things so did you ever or do they still use the agm 114 hellfire missile <laughs> you ever heard of that i'm not familiar with that is that a thing the uh, the AGM one one four missile yeah that's uh that's more loaded on uh, helicopters <clears throat> it's one of the okay. primary missiles for helicopters we we did not fly that on the P three Charlie aircraft um, I know a very I basically know the nomenclature of that missile I don't know the ins and outs of it because I've only really studied that for the exam um, but I've never worked with that hand I mean I've never worked with that missile with my own hands and that's mainly how I learn so. That is a missile that we still use to this day, though, yes. But, and, that, and that brings up an interesting question in regards to advancement and rating exams and things like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff you probably have to know that you've never had to work with. How do you learn about that? Or at least enough to potentially answer the right question on a rating exam? So there's, uh, 
you know, most of the stuff in aviation ordinance you're going to work with um, no matter where you are. Um, but there's also what we call bibliographies that give you the sections that the that are going to be in the test uh, for the for the advancement exam. Um, and they also have, you know, Nav Navetra has a non-residential training course books that you can order as well that have all the information of the rating and everything in there also. Um, and then the publications, you know, Navera publications and all the publications that you use for your job, that's where you would get your answers and study. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of study material, right? So, you know, it, it is, it's physical and mental at the same time. Yes, yes, okay. definitely. So another question came out was, do, does the aircraft have air-to-air -air missiles? The P-3 Charlie does not have air-to-air -air missiles. Um, we primarily focus on the air-to-ground or anti-submarine warfare. Okay. Yeah, if you're in an air-to-air -air combat fight with the P-3, um, P-3 is probably not going to win. So when you were in, back into recruit training, okay, so they're going way back here. Um, <laughs> you went through recruit training. Was there anything in particular that you found very challenging? Like, again, it, 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 the, it's a confidence builder. Like, how do you get your mindset around things? And, and I know this is where some of our cadets go to. But, you know, was there something in particular in recruit training? Right. You'd be going um, back. That you had to overcome in order to be successful. And how'd you do it? Recruit training for me, the it was – overall, recruit training was pretty easy for me. Um, you know, if you go in there with an open mind and you do what's asked of you and you do it right and you do it right the first time, you're going to have a pretty easy day when it comes to recruit training. Um, now, one thing that was difficult for me personally, just I don't – I've, I've always had a problem memorizing stuff. And probably about 80% of the stuff that you're going to be asked in boot camp, you're going to have to memorize. Um, but the cool thing is rep, uh, repetition is going to help you memorize or help, help me memorize because if I didn't memorize after so much rep, rep, um, repetition, uh, you know, we, we'd get really strong in, in boot camp if you didn't memorize what you had to. Real strong means a lot of upper arm work in the push-up position. <laughs> yep. Yes, sir. A lot of upper arm work, a lot of uh, get some solid abs, too. Well, see, there, there's a plus everywhere, right? So that's good. <laughs> so, so, Pastor Gosson, I really want to thank you for sharing your experiences in aviation ordinance. Um, it was very inter uh, enlightening to me, you know, the fact that, again, I, I work with AOs. They, they have great camaraderie. You're, you're absolutely dead on in regards to the loudest and the proudest. Um, and, and the things that you're working with, you have to know what you're doing. The responsibility is awesome and it has to work every single time. You can't just like not pay attention to something and you, you, it gets dropped, right? Dropping a torpedo is a bad day, right? Um, you know, so not just the paperwork associated with it, but like with anything else, you know, people get injured, people, you know, seriously. So it is an awesome responsibility. Um, I thank you you know, on behalf of, a, you know, the rest of us in the nation for, for you doing what you're doing. And for the Sea Cadet Corps in particular, I really want to thank you for sharing your story and giving that insight and what it's like to be an AO, you know, out in the fleet. So really appreciate it. Well done. Yeah, sir. Thank you. So, so cadets, uh, again, uh, after the video is uh, uploaded and ready to roll, we will post the, uh, the directions of where to access the online quiz. Please take that. Everything that we've talked about today in this presentation was is on the quiz in one way, shape, or form. If not, you know, use the internet. You know you're good at it, so uh, do a quick look. But uh, take care of the quiz, get the virtual drill credit, and uh, you know, remember what you learned here today. So everyone involved, thank you very much for another great episode of Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, and we'll be talking to you again next week with another interesting topic. Take care, everybody. Thank you.